Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. There have been many people over the years and decades who have died and then for some what doctors would call unexplained reason, they've come back to life. And the world calls it a near-death experience. But I call it a heavenly encounter. For most people. There have been some people it hasn't been all that heavenly. But it's really interesting when you start looking at some of the reports and surveys that have been made over the years, did you know that over 4% of the population of the United States, they surveyed 1,000 people, and over 4% of the people said that they had experienced a near-death experience. And what we mean by that is they were pronounced dead, but then they came back. That means it's, that's close to one out of every 25 people. Now you may say, That's, uh, that can't be. Well, it is. And the reality in all of this is that a lot of people don't like to talk about it. Because if you talk about it, people think you're a kook. And they just write it off as you didn't really die, you just went into a coma, and you had a dream about heaven or something. But God has not given us the spirit of fear. And one thing that I think that is kind of unique is that uh, so many people who are Christians fear death. But death is not something that should be feared. When it comes to a Christian, it should be something. Now, when I say death, I'm just talking about your body quitting working because technically a Christian doesn't die. Your spirit's born again and your eternal life started the moment you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So we'll be referring to it as a departure. Christians should not fear the departure. And the sad thing is many Christians do. In fact, most Christians do. They see departing, not all Christians, but many see departing as as kind of a sad thing. And I've asked myself, why is it that we would fear departing? And I think the answer is very simply, is we really don't have a clear vision of what heaven really is. We think we know, we talk about it, But is it deep in our hearts? Now, granted, if you have a child, a a sibling, or a parent, and they pass, of course you're going to miss them. And there might be a type of sadness because you know that you're not going to be able to, on a daily basis while you're on this side of glory, be able to fellowship with them the way you were. And then again, with some you may be glad that fellowship is gone. (laughs) Just depends. But uh, Paul said, our present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory, the way he put it, the glory that will be revealed in us. See, I think we need to understand that heaven is a place to be desired. It is a place to be desired. It's not a place to be feared. Hmm. Well, there was a a doctor a few years ago, uh, Dr. Eby, and he had an encounter. And I have some of this written down so I would get it just exactly right. But he was a well-respected person. And... He was helping his wife clean out 
a relative's apartment in Chicago. And he had one of the boxes, and he went over to the rail, and it was up on the second floor. And the rail, he didn't realize it, but the rail had been kind of taken out by termites. And he leaned up against it, and he fell two stories and landed on the concrete on his head. Now, here is his own words. He said, the eggshell of my skull completely broke apart. Keep in mind, he's a medical doctor. And broke the large blood vessel in my brain. Wow. My eyes popped out. I was dead on impact. And then they took him to the morgue. And he came back to life. Here's what he said happened while he was declared dead. He said, I was the same size, the same shape as a person I had seen in the mirror for years. I was clothed in a translucent flowing gown. See, now he's, he's saying it in his words, but we would think maybe like a robe. Translucent, what does that mean? That means you could kind of see through it. But transparent to my gaze. In amazement, I could see through my body and note, wow, the gorgeously white flowers behind and beneath me. This seemed perfectly normal. What does that tell us? That tells us there wasn't any fear there. It just seemed like it was normal. Yet, he said, thrilling and novel. <laughs> my feet were easy to see. I did not need my bifocals. I had instantly noted that my eyes were unlimited in their range of vision. 10 inches. 10 miles made no difference. It was all sharp and clear. There were no bones or blood vessels or organs. No blood. He said, now listen to this. He said, I noticed the absence of genitals. My abdomen and chest were organless and transparent to my gaze though translucent to my peripheral vision. Again, my mind, which worked here in heaven with electric light speed, answered my unspoken question. And his unspoken question is, why didn't he have any organs? He said, they are not needed. Here, here was the answer that he received. They are not needed. Jesus is the life here. He is the needed energy. So he is what fills us. In him is life. In him is life. Now someone may say, well, that's kind of interesting. I mean, you have this medical doctor that uh, had this experience. Hmm. Can we trust it? Well, what's interesting is in all of these heavenly encounters, so many of them parallel each other. And so close. Hmm. You know, there was a, uh, I think we should find this scripture and, and just read it. I, I wrote it down here someplace, so give me one moment. Here we go. In Matthew chapter 17, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9, there's a story that is told, an encounter that is told in all three of those, and we're going to read from Mark, okay? Mark chapter 9, verse 2. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them. 
Now, it's interesting that he didn't take all of his disciples. And this is a question I've had for many years. Why was it that he only took Peter, James, and John? Well, I noticed in another place, in another story in the Bible, where Jesus healed someone who was, they thought was dead, because they were. Jesus brought this person back to life. That Jesus kicked everybody out, but he took in with him Peter, James, and John. Well, this was his inner circle. And the answer to my question came one time during prayer, and it was this. There is an inner circle of people who are seeking after the deep things of God. And there's a, a vast amount of people who are just seeking God, loving God, worship Him. But there are those who dig deeper. There are those who want to get very, very intimate with Him. Peter, James, and John. That was his inner circle. I made a decision. I want to be in God's inner circle. If something's going to happen, I want to be there. I want to see it. I don't have to see it to believe it, but I still would like to see it. Are you following me? Verse 3, his clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, so such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Wow. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he didn't know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. That word afraid there is not the type of fear like fearful of their life. That means awesome respect. This was a very take your breath away type moment. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Look at verse 10. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. See, Jesus continually gives us insight. But we need the Holy Spirit to give us revelation of what that insight means. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Why do you think that it said that he, he glowed? Because God is light. We need to understand that, that the force of light is the force of the universe. Because the force of light is God. James, may the force be with you. Wow. You know, uh, several years ago, a good friend of mine was here, uh, Dr. Gary Wood, and he spoke here at the church. And um, he had a very interesting, very interesting thing happen to him. And I'm going to share that in just a moment. But I thought that something that's kind of interesting is Job 38, 15. Job 38, 15. God tells Job that the wicked are denied the light. The wicked. Their light is withheld. See, there is the kingdom of light, and there's the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness is evil, but the kingdom of light should not be feared. 
You're going to find when it comes your time to depart, if Jesus doesn't return soon, you know, and we need to understand this. Uh, if Jesus doesn't return in the next 100 years, they may be having the 128th anniversary celebration of Walk on the Water Faith Church right here. But there will be a different pastor and there will be a different congregation. All of us in 120, in 100 years from now, will have departed. Don't be afraid of departing. Wow. You know, Mike Warnicke many years ago said that a guy put a 38 revolver in his stomach and asked him to deny Jesus. And he said, he said, that revolver just represented to him a one-way ticket home. You cannot threaten a Christian with death. Well, Gary Wood was a longtime friend of mine, and, and I wrote this down so that I would not say anything that was incorrect. But he was uh, raised in a very abusive home. His mother and father were both alcoholics, and his father sexually abused him. And when he wouldn't cooperate, his father would take cigarettes and put them out on this young boy's body. And uh, until the day he departed, Gary had those marks on his body. He uh, was in an automobile accident. What happened was his, his parents were so abusive, they actually one day just dropped him off at his grandparents' house, just dropped him off, and him and his sister. And so he and his sister took on their name, and um, their, their name was Wood, so he became Gary Wood. But he went to uh, Wayland College. It was a Baptist school. He was a world-class singer. In fact, he had won, I don't even know if I have this written down here or not, but he had, had won uh, several championships uh, for vocal. Back in the day, they didn't have uh, The Voice or America's Got Talent, you know, but, but he, he won what they had back in that day. But his sister was with him, and he was on his way uh, traveling in the car, and it was Christmas Eve, and um, he had a car accident. They were singing Silent Night, and all of a sudden it just seemed like there was a large explosion. Now let me tell you something about Gary Wood. Gary is a dear friend, a lifelong minister, he has character and integrity. He is not one to have made up a story. All right. But when he was driving his car, uh, the weather was bad. There was an explosion. I never did, never did have him explain to me what the explosion was, but there was some type of an explosion. And he felt severe pain in his face. And then in an instant, he was free from the pain, from all pain, and he slipped out of his body as though, he said, as though he was just kind of slipping out of the house robe. You just kind of just slipped out of his body. He said, in a moment, I was above the car where I could see my body as though the top of the car had been removed. He could hear his sister crying. And as he looked down at his own body, he saw his life go by in an instant. You know, we've had people, and I'm sure you've heard about that, you know, they say they, they relive their life in just a moment of time. But he said there was no fear, there was no sorrow, and there was no confusion. What does the word tell us about the Lord? He's not the author of confusion. He's not trying to trick us. He's not trying to keep things hidden from us. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that things could be revealed to us. It was as though I was swirling in a funnel-shaped cloud that grew brighter and brighter as it began to ascend 
through a tunnel of light. Now, not everybody has a tunnel of light, but for some reason, that is the predominant thing that people who have had uh, heavenly encounters, wow, hmm. It's interesting, he said he had a tranquil feeling, and he said it was effortless moving. He, he told me, he said, it's kind of like when you're standing on one of those things at the airport, you know, an escalator that just moves level, you know, it's just taking you somewhere. Hmm. He told me, he said, I could hear angels singing. He, he shared all this, and he said, I could hear angels singing all around me. And he said, I could specifically remember the words to the song that they sang. And here's his quote, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory, power, wisdom, and dominion. Be thine forever, O Lord. Amen and amen. Wow. He said, as he reached what seemed to be his destination, he began walking on lush green carpet of grass that covered the entire hillside. He said, when he looked down, he noticed that the grass came all the way through his feet. There was no indentation in the grass where he walked. Now, somebody may say, that's weird. Does that mean that when we're in heaven then, and we have our, you know, after the rapture, we have our resurrected, glorified bodies, that that's the way it's going to be? Now, keep in mind, Gary did not have a resurrected, glorified body. Now, you need to remember that. He did not have a resurrected, glorified body. He has what is referred to as a spirit body. That's the body that you have after you depart, but before the rapture. At the rapture, you get your glorified body. And your body is like the body that Jesus had when he was here on earth, after he was glorified. That means Jesus ate fish. I mean, you know, he talked with people. I mean... You know, he, he had a, what you, a, a body you could touch. He told Thomas, he said, touch me, handle me, see that I am not flesh and bone. Wow. As he looked around, he saw the outer portion of a magnificent city. We got to understand that heaven is described as a city. But the scripture says, in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. So our final destination at the end of the millennium is going to be the New Jerusalem. That's where we're going to, that's going to be our home place. That's where Jesus is, has made a, a place for us. In John chapter 14, when he said, in my house are many mansions, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, that's where his heavenly house is because the scripture tells us that's where God lives. Okay? As he looked around, he saw the outer portion of a magnificent city. As he approached, there was a beautiful gate in front of him. And he described it as what looked like, and he names all the jewels. Wow. He said, it was the most magnificent work of art I have ever seen. The wall was so high that it seemed like it would go on forever. Hmm. He said, at this gate, there was an angel, a giant angel. And the angel was holding a sword. He said he was at least 40 foot tall. Wow. You know, we've had, and I've shared this before, we've had visitors who have been to our church, not at the same time who did not know each other, write us and call us and tell us that right over here they saw an angel standing with a sword and the angel was so tall that he had to bend over. I thought, you know, when one person tells you that, that's interesting. But when another person tells you that from another state who was at that service, who doesn't know the other person, and they saw the same thing in the same place, both describing the bending over and everything. 
Let me tell you something. There are times when you can see into the realm of the Spirit when others can't. Just like the prophet and his assistant, when the prophet saw the armies of God and then he said to, to the Lord, open the eyes of my servant so he can see what I'm seeing. Wow. His hair looked like spun gold. Wow. With rays of light flowing from this magnificent being. That's the way he described it. Another angel came through the gate and was checking the pages of a book that he was carrying. He nodded to the giant angel, confirming Gary could come in the city. Wow. Gary had a friend, and his friend, I believe, had been killed earlier, tragically. It was Gary's best friend. And his friend came and met him. And I thought that was kind of interesting because it kind of reveals what the Bible tells us. That we're going to, when we get to heaven, we're going to see our family. Now this part is a little puzzling for us to understand, but we're going to see our family as we know them. And, well, it's kind of like Abraham. It says, and he went to be, it didn't say, and he went to heaven. It says, and he went to be with his fathers. Wow, isn't that interesting? Hmm. His friend, who was his guide, took him to a very large building. It was like a library. The walls were solid gold, sparkling with a dazzling display of light that, that loomed up to a crystal-domed ceiling. There were hundreds upon hundreds of books in this library, and each book had a cover of beautifully carved gold with a letter of the alphabet engraved on the outside. Many angels were present reading the contents of the books. Gary asked his friend, he said, why are the angels reading the books? His friend explained that these books contained the record of every person's life who had ever been born throughout all of history. Everything that was done on earth, good or bad, was recorded in these books. Wow. But I'm going on here. <laughs> Gary watched as an angel opened one of the books and with a cloth wiped the pages. Oh boy, that's the good part. The writing vanished and the page turned red, leaving only a name. When Gary asked what this meant, his guide, his friend, said, the red represents the cleansing from the blood of Jesus, your Savior. Wow. And then the names were transferred to the Lamb's Book of Life. And the sins were remembered no more. Oh, wow. Then uh, he goes on. I'm not going to tell all of this, but he, he talks about how the angel pulls a, a book out, and it's a book with Gary's name on it, and how it gets wiped clean. On the book it said, Paid in full by the precious red blood of Jesus. After leaving the library, he went to an auditorium. And everyone there was clothed in glowing robes. Hmm. He saw a beautiful staircase. He saw a beautiful river. Boy, there's just almost too much to, to tell here. He saw that this river was flowing from the throne of God. Hmm. And around the throne, he saw the 24 elders. His guide then led him into the water. Stepping into the water, he discovered that the water was only ankle deep. But then he, it began to rise as he walked. I guess that would be like out here at the Lake of the Ozarks. As you walk out into it, it starts getting deeper. But then... He could easily reach down and pick up golden nuggets along the bottom. And then when he reached a point where the water went over his head, it was like he didn't have to breathe. He could be under the water just as easy as he could be above the water. And he 
communicated with his guide, his friend, without actually talking with his mouth and saying words. He would think a thought, and then he'd receive a thought. Growing along the Crystal River were orchards, which, by the way, the word orchard and garden in the Old Testament and the New Testament is translated in our Bible as paradise. Wow, isn't that interesting? Each fruit was a gift, and when eaten, the gift would explode inside the person eating it. The, the fruit represented gifts of knowledge. And then he saw the tree of life, which was gold with long limbs, and it covered all that fruit. Wow. And then there was a multitude of people singing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. I thought this was kind of interesting. He said, being a Baptist, he asked his guide, why are they singing from the Baptist hymnal? <laughs> and uh, his friend replied, all the songs of the Spirit originate here in heaven. And they are given to someone on earth who will birth that song into existence in the physical realm. Wow. Gary was told years later by the Holy Spirit that the songs being sung on earth that he had originally heard in heaven years before that had originated in heaven were Alleluia and he is Lord. Hmm. It's interesting to me that when my son passed away on January the 1st of last year, of a year ago this last January 1st, when they put his body out into the shed behind the funeral home and unzipped it and left me alone in there with him. That I love you, Lord, and he is Lord, was the song. I put my hand on his chest, and that's the song I sang. And it makes me realize that there is a thin veil between this side and the other side. And even though Robbie was not in that body, even though he was not in that body, I believe in the spirit he sang with me. It's, uh, when it comes to music, and I know we have several people in our church who, who write songs, it's very important to be led by the Holy Spirit when you write a song. And if you are led by the Holy Spirit, you could be writing a song from heaven. And there's something about worshiping when you sang a song that was written in heaven. Hmm. Somebody may say, are you sure that God really likes music? Well, we have 150 psalms right in the middle of our Bible, okay? So uh, Gary was then led to a school playground area, and he marveled at the brilliant colors. You know, and I've had people tell me this, that there are colors you can see there that do not exist here. And there are frequencies of sound that you can hear there that you cannot hear here. Wow. He says, then Jesus arrived. You think, well, now wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean of all the people who die, that Jesus himself would pick Gary Wood, Dr. Gary Wood, to go to. Well, the one thing we must not forget, Jesus is God. God is omnipresent. That's how it could be that you can be talking with God in prayer. You can be talking with God in the name of Jesus in prayer and 281 million other people on this earth can be talking with him in prayer. And each one of you are talking intimately because he is omnipresent. Wow. 
And when Jesus arrived, it said all the little children ran to him. You mean there's going to be children in heaven? Oh, yes. There are countless encounters, countless encounters, many of them verifiable, of people who have gone to heaven and they've met a, a brother or a sister as a child that they didn't know they had. You know, either aborted or a miscarriage. Hmm. Well, I can't uh, completely describe everything that Gary saw when he was in heaven. But I think one thing to understand is uh, he saw something that several other people have seen, and that was a spare parts room. I know that sounds weird, but a, a, a room where there was images of body parts that they were just sending down for people to be healed. I, I have a friend who was told he was going to die of pancreatic cancer. And that was like how many years ago? And he's alive now. Um, but Jesus stood before Gary And I think that uh, I think we just need to understand how personal Jesus is for us. You know, Jesus loves you and you. And, and many, many years ago, I remember getting this vision of how I was told by the Holy Spirit that if only one would accept Jesus, he would have still died. If you were the only one who would accept Jesus, he would have still died for you. He loves you that much. Wow. Hmm. When uh, Gary was talking with Jesus... He said he could see the indentations on his brow. He said it this way, no words spoken can truly describe him. So uh, Jesus spoke to Gary and he said this, there is a song for you to sing, a missionary journey you are going to take and a book you're going to write. There's a purpose for you being here in this life. And he said, don't ever buy the condemnation of the devil that tells you you are unworthy. You are worthy. You have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Jesus said, why do my people not believe in me? Why do they reject me? Why do they not walk in my commandments? He told Gary that there would be three things that would mark his time before his return. So Jesus said to him, there's going to be three things happen before I return. There's going to be a spirit of restoration. There's going to be a spirit of prayer. And there's going to be an outburst of miracles. And I'm ready for all three right now. He said, remember what I told you. The Father and I are one. When I speak, the Father has spoken. Above all else, love one another and always be forgiving toward each other. Wow. Well, back on earth. Gary was pronounced dead at the scene. His sister was praying in the name of Jesus for her brother. And his friend said to him, his guide said, you got to go back. She's using that name. <laughs> Gary recounts he didn't want to go back. See, and I think I've been with, I have no idea how many people I've been with when they've departed, when they've stepped over. Uh, being in the ministry for over 50 years, you're with a lot of people when they depart. But I will tell you this. When a Christian departs, no matter what the circumstance, there is a peace that comes. 
And sometimes you can see it in their eyes. You know, Loretta's grandpa, I, I love this story. He was, uh, he was one of the head guys at NASA. And he is the one who designed and, and wired all of the inside of the space capsule for Apollo 8. In fact, we went down there to Huntsville to NASA, and he walked us around, and he showed us the Apollo 8 capsule. And he says, see all that yellow wiring around there? I designed that, and I did that. You know, he was a real, real cool guy. He was in World War I, and he was in World War II. And he was one of those guys that wore a short sleeve white shirt with a little thin black tie and a pocket protector with about five pencils in it. And a slide rule, you know. He was very meticulous. Well, when he was about ready to depart, uh, he was lying in bed, and the way I understand it, uh, the nurse came in, and he sat up in bed, and, and, he, and he saluted, like, I'm ready, you know. And smiled, laid down, and he was gone. I believe he saw the commander come in the room. You know, I, was, he's the commander. Jesus is the commander. I believe he saw the commander come in. Yes, sir. And he was out of there, you know. Um, hmm. So immediately, oh, he, Jesus told him, you must tell my people to get ready. Get ready. I am coming back soon. Immediately he was shot out of heaven and hurled back into his body. The paramedics noticed signs of life and they rushed him to the hospital. The steering wheel being through him, his jaw was broken in three places. His teeth were just powder. The impact of the steering me mechanism had crushed his larynx and caused his death by suffocation. That's what they said. The doctor told him he would never talk, much less ever be able to sing again. But Gary talked, preached, sang, and wrote a book. And that's what can happen. She's using that name. Well, we need to use that name. And we need to get rid of the fear of departure. Now, granted, granted, that doesn't mean just, you know, eat ho-hos and drink Coke and try to make yourself go. No, you still got to eat right, exercise, because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture tells us to take care of the temple. Sometimes we need temple cleansing. Sometimes we need temple repair. Take care of the temple, because out of this temple is how your spirit ministers on this earth to get other people to come to Jesus. And I've heard it said that, well, when the, and I've said it, when the temple won't work anymore, the spirit departs. But I've come to a revelation lately. The spirit departs first. So, well, praise God. I know that this was a little bit of a, an unorthodox message today. But it's just really been bearing on me about how people fear the departure. And we shouldn't fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Stand up and say this. God has not given me the spirit of fear. I will not fear my departure. All right. God is good. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We thank you, Father, that you made a way that we can live forever with you in resurrected, glorified bodies like the body that you gave your son, and that we can fellowship together with friends and family for eternity with no sickness, no disease, no fear, no enemy, but total peace and joy. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen.